Well, welcome to the Journey Together podcast with Joshua and Anna Gresham. Hey, you guys. Uh, We are thrilled to be with you all today. Do you know how you have certain habits and you need to break them, but you don't know how to break them? What habit are we talking about, Joshua? I have noticed in a lot of the podcasts, if not all of them, I will start off with our intro and then you will say something snappy, like an emotional snappiness, like... I'm doing wonderful, or we're so glad that you're tuned in, or something of that nature. And then I have the habit of, of saying, yes, <laughs> I will answer your statement with a yes. And I say that pretty much every single time we start a podcast. Have you noticed that? Okay. I think I've noticed that uh, that you start off with like your your radio voice. Right. Welcome to the Journey Together <laughs> right. podcast yeah. with Joshua and Anna Gresham. So and then, then you say something and I then I go, I try to have like yes. a normal response to that. Yeah. And then I always respond with, yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm going to break this habit. I'm just telling you. Is it a everybody. bad habit? Well, it's just not something I want to do every single episode that we record. Do we care? I care. Because you, now you're aware. Now I'm aware. You want to grow. It's a filler you wanna, word. You want to grow. Yeah. But you're responding to me. But I will continue to have my radio voice when I start the podcast. <laughs> do we do we need to have a radio voice on the podcast? I don't think that's what it is. I think it's because I have the most <laughs> oxygen in my lungs when I start. Because I'm like... <gasps> so you took one giant breath. Welcome to the journey to together. To deliver the yeah. love and joy. It's the singing voice from the tummy and not my head voice. Wow. That's why. That's why it sounds fuller. That's why they tell you to sing from your gut. You know, it's super funny. Yep. Before we start these podcasts, we'll, of course, discuss and talk about what we're going to talk about. And this one, right before we started, we were like, all right, 25 minutes. We're going to jump right in and start talking about what we <laughs> need to talk about. We are. Are we? I'll get there. Okay. I know, I know, we are getting there because because you cl- you you click this because you saw the title. This is a clickbait title. It is. I don't care. I will call it out. To have no no no. That's not it. That what? was it. That was not it at all. I want a new marriage. Oh, I I was going to say how to have a new marriage. No, see that's the clickbait. The clickbait is I want a new marriage. Then you'd be like, I want a new marriage. What do they mean by this? And then. She's saying it the proper, correct way, which is how to have a new marriage. That's right. Right. You're like the PG, I'm like the PG-13 version, where people are like, they want a new marriage, and that's the problem. A lot of times people think, I just got to get a new, a new thing. It's like trading in a, a used car. Wow. It's, wow. That's where it's at, though. It's the quick, it's, it's, it's not the quick, easy fix, because we know that. It's not hey, easy. If I was a car, I would not be a minivan, <laughs> even though I've had a couple of those now. You've had a couple of those. All right, back to the point at hand, how to basically have a new marriage is what we want to talk about today. Some key elements, and we've talked about these before, and we'll layer some things on top of it, so it's not like the same old message wrapped in a new wrapping here, there is, there is a process and there's some steps you have to take. And one of those is to, to get rid of comparison, first of all, because you begin to compare of like, oh, I bet, bet it's better over there. I bet it's going to be easier over here. And, and I know that you've gotten into some ruts where you just feel like you can't get out and the person's not going to change. Like habit Forming ruts, yes. ruts formed by you um, just see a cycle monotony of the of same things over despair. and over. Despair. <laughs> we mentioned this in a message not too long ago, but a cycle of despair. You're just constantly going, and you don't see a way out. And there's somewhat of this like you're just dreading everything. You come home, you're dreading. Is it going to be the same it was yesterday? Is anything ever going right. to change? And what's it, what needs to change? There is going to be easier ways for it to change. If you're both believers in Christ Jesus, then I know for a fact that God can come in and he can fix the heart. Uh, for others that are dealing with maybe a spouse that isn't um, 
a Christian, it is going to be much difficult, more difficult than, um, than you know, for maybe uh, a husband and wife who are Christians, sold out for Christ, you know. Right. Because, sure, there's a lot of people who say they're Christians, but it's not necessarily that they're re- willing to listen and do what the Word of God's instructing them to, them to or do. Or if you've got a spouse that's unaware of certain things happening in the marriage, uh, on their end and their habits are, are challenging. Yeah. Or p- possibly they've got addiction uh, that they're facing, and it's just a struggle. You know, whenever you think about the Word of God and when you are married to someone that you are constantly believing the Lord for, God has a grace for you that is abundant grace, His abundant grace that I believe is really a continual relying upon where you go, am I relying upon God's abundant grace and how I love and minister? Uh, Am I constantly in the Word of God and renewing my mind to scriptures on love and allowing the Holy Spirit to lead and guide me to be a testimony to my spouse rather than living in this place of frustration? Because essentially you are an example and a testimony to your spouse when you are married to someone that's... um, that's not a believer. Okay. So in wanting to change our marriage or have a better marriage, we've got to say it that you, it for, I can't change you. You can't change me. We can pray for each other Mm -hmm. and we should. Yeah. That's, I mean, evident, um, according to God's word, pray according to God's word. But ultimately this change begins in my own heart. If I want a better marriage, then it's recognizing that I need to change. And that change comes from my personal relationship with God. And I am accountable to the Lord on how I love and treat and nurture and care for you. And there should be a healthy fear of God in saying, Lord, I want to I want to grow. Like, I actually want to have a better marriage. I want a new marriage because I want to continually grow as a daughter um, of God and a disciple of Christ Jesus. So I'm going to tell you first things first for me and saying, God, I want a new marriage. It's really putting my, um, uh, my heart out on the line before the Lord and saying, God, examine my heart. I've asked the Lord this before. You know, what really has helped me tremendously is reading first Corinthians 13, the love chapter I like to read it in different translations. And I'm not talking about one time. Like this is a meditation of your heart where you're walking through and I'm going, oh, all right, God, am I doing this? Holy Spirit, help me. We have the love of God shed abroad in our heart by the power of the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, help me. Am I keeping tally marks with you of things I've been frustrated about? Am I doing this? Am I walking in forgiveness? Am I, you know, whatever that uh, acknowledgement is. And then... You ask the Holy Spirit to help you, so you start to change. That's huge in having a new marriage. I don't know about, nobody's changing your marriage except for you getting in and it's God. Right, yeah. Done, episode done. (laughs) Well, I think that's going, that's why I flipped the Bible to 1 Corinthians 13. I think both husband and wife should focus in on this chapter um, apart from one another, and then together as well. But focusing and and judging yourself to where am I in my walk with Christ? If your spouse, we have a great book that we just read. To, both of us read it, and uh, I'll I'll tell you what it is in just a second. But let me tell you, if it's a husband and wife, and um, you can't make the excuse that you don't like to read. Let me say that first. You have to put in the work. So if it's 10 pages a day, read 10 pages a day and get through the book, okay? Um, don't read the book and then want to discuss it after every chapter, but discuss it when it's finished, where you can complete. But really the entire time you're examining your heart and um, through that process of love and development, you'll say, I mean, I'm, you know, okay, I know myself. I need to fix this or I need to quicken myself to know what I should be doing. And that helps, and it goes along with 1 Corinthians 13, because you should be self-examining. You know, don't always be pointing out at your spouse. So it's going to be easier if you are Christians, if you are willing to want to make this work. So this is 
If you're wanting a new marriage, a, f- a fresh new vision for your marriage and a fresh new start in your marriage, then this uh, is where it's going to going to need to take place. It's going to start at self-examination, 1 Corinthians 13, Am I Walking in Love? And the book that you and I just read is... Love is the Way to Victory by Kenneth Hagan. And I got to tell you, one of the best books I have ever read... So on love. On love, yeah. on the love of God that has changed changed my life. And I it mean, puts the responsibility on the individual. It, it, it checks yeah. your heart. It checks what you've been saying, how you're... Uh, how you're responding, (laughs) all of those things. Uh, It's it's just amazing. That God is love, and uh, apart from that, if you are not walking in love, then you're walking in sin. And I don't want to be in my marriage in a position where uh, I think that I'm doing okay, but honestly, I'm not, because I'm not allowing the love of God to rule my heart. His love should actually rule our hearts. And what comes with the love of God? Well, Jesus is a reflection of God's love. Right. Jesus is uh, the redemptive power of God's love in our life. And then we have the Holy Spirit that that is how the love of God is placed in our heart by His Holy Spirit to help us to live for Jesus. But it's it's truly saying, okay, I actually, I don't want to be selfish I want to forgive. Uh, I mean, it's 1 Corinthians 13 points, this picture of it. But um, I really, God, I want to honor you yeah. in how I love my spouse. You want a new marriage? You all, this is everything. Because it's going to be the very foundation of what your marriage walks upon um, is is the love of God. Yeah, and when you say God's going to put that love in you, let me give you... Uh, the briefest synopsis of 1 Corinthians 13 that I can give you, and that is that love is not an emotion, it's a commitment. So that's important, that that commitment, it's the knowledge of love that that he downloads to you where you go, oh, this is what love is. This is what love looks like. This is commitment. This is a process. This is a growing. This is a, a balance, a, a, a weight on you where you go, there's... There's a responsibility that I have to take on when it comes to love. So it's, the world will tell you that it's an emotion and, and shoot you with a heart dart with a, a you know, flying fairy. That's not it. A cherub. A cherub. <laughs> <laughs> flying what fairy, I don't know. know. <laughs> it sounded better. Whatever it is. But it is important, though, that it's a commitment, that it is something that you're committed to doing. So wanting a new marriage, you've got to have a commitment. So maybe some things have gotten stale. So, so let's go into some natural things here. Uh, maybe you need to change the environment. Not that change is the answer, meaning like, let's get all new furniture, or, but maybe it is going into the living room, and maybe it is saying, hey, let's paint this room together. Let's do something together where you're building something together, doing something where you're expressing... Right, where you're growing it. Yeah, you're, you're ex- adding something new into your life. Yeah, and expressing just, creativity, yeah. expressing another aspect of who you are, and you're doing it together, and you're coming together in that that beautiful picture. Now, often whenever you start projects like that, there is an open door for uh I'll call it a I'll call it out for what it is, a critical spirit. Sure, you can get critical. Rain. So you're going to you're going to have to recognize if you're critical or not. That goes back to it all the foundation goes back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 of you continually meditating and placing this into your heart. Because you cannot reap a seed, you cannot reap a harvest from a seed that you did not plant. If you have not planted God's word on the love of God, because I know for us, we have made a decision. We've been married 20 years that we want, we want a be- we want God's best. We want a new marriage. We want his best marriage uh, for our our lives. And we're trying to be really intentional about it. Uh, and planting good seed, but it comes from first planting the word of God uh, as that seed on the inside of us to where it becomes a reality. So then by the spirit of God, when these things come up, you know that you're being led by the Holy Spirit and that's everything. Okay. Okay. So when it comes to um, doing new things together or re-identifying some of these things, 
you know, I think sometimes people can get crazy and go over the top. And then before you know it, you're overwhelmed and you're just... I don't care if they do it together. My concern is if one of the spouse, they're, they're choosing not to do it. So right. the one person is exploring a newness about themselves. It could be a fitness thing. And then one's over there doing it and the other one's not. One is playing pickleball and the other refuses. Yeah, that's where I get concerned. I mean, okay, that might sound silly, but you guys, those things are valuable in your marriage where one spouse is like, hey, you know what? Uh, I'd really love to do this. Other spouse is like, stupid, not doing it. You're going you're gonna to be stuck in that pit of despair or rejection. I mean, that just feeds that. Yeah, now don't, okay. I'm, I want to be a realist okay. because not you and I are blessed. You and I are both outgoing. We love the outdoors. We love doing things athletic. Not every spouse has that. One may be more than the other. And I, right. I understand right. it. Yeah. Okay, so we, yeah. ha, we are blessed in that way. But I think that you can have a balance that you, you're able to do one, one, thing, one thing together. I think you can find that yeah. where it's it's setting time apart that we're going to do this together and figure that out. You have to figure it out. Take some time. Maybe you try something. You're like, no, that was not fun or I hated that or whatever. Don't get mad at the spouse who says, I hate that when you liked it. Let's try something different. Let's try another thing. Let's whatever that hobby may be, get in there and start doing it together. But I still think there could be... Um, a, you know, and not an imbalance, but another side thing where it's like, oh, but I still like doing this. And the other ones, you know, the other spouse doesn't. Do you feel like it's but, challenging, though, sometimes just to share your heart with that? Because I think so very, often, yes. you know, we talk about this like, oh, yeah, go do this. Go do that. Yeah, yeah, that's great. But then when it comes, when it boils down to it, you open your heart up to that and then somebody shoots it down or the conversation is not healthy. Um and then it, then it, there's hurt involved and then nobody wants to do anything again. And you stay back in that cycle of almost living separate lives and then coming together ever so often. So you guys, I think this is once again, that awareness of um, what a gentle conversation looks like and what selfish ambition looks like or living in a position of often if... <laughs> If you don't want to do something that your spouse wants to do and your spouse responds in an unkind way, it could be because they themselves are feeling rejected from what you just said. Typically, it's both people are battling a little bit of insecurity yeah. on what it is, and we just need to be aware yeah. that we're in this together. And uh, recently, so you like to road bike. You got a new road bike, so I could have your old road bike and us to start cycling together. And this season in our life, we've talked about it in the last episode, has been super full. And we're doing these two workouts, so 75 hard, lots going on. Um, and I have not been able to road bike with you and just enjoy it right now because it was just too much mentally. And it was kind of a hard conversation for us because I didn't really know how to explain it. And I said, one day I will, but then you wanted me to. And I, I think we finally came to a place where we were like, okay, I'm not trying to reject you. You're not trying to force me. Um, maybe, maybe what I'm trying to say with all of this is recognize that if you are being too sensitive in this conversation or be willing to actually walk through and work it out till you come to a place of a resolve to where each other, you, you are hearing what the other person is saying. Do yeah. you understand what uh, I mean? Yeah, for sure. I totally agree. Yeah, and this is just a vulnerability of who you are. And you need to be willing to be vulnerable. This this is your best person to be vulnerable in front of. And whether it's embarrassing or hard or whatever, it has to happen. Um, don't, you know, you don't have to have some facade up. So yeah, just be honest and, and be upfront. I think that's completely yeah. fine and fair. Uh, but you 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 touched on something briefly that needs to be talked about in a greater measure, and that is sometimes there is a deep rooted seed of something. That's the prayer with 1 Corinthians 13 right. and, and examining your heart to get out some of these deep-rooted reasonings to not want to do something or don't, you know, want, 
you, you just are bitter and sad and upset and you're not willing to change. So even though I tell you some natural things to go do, go get a hobby together, go do something fun together, go out of the way to do something crazy, that may still not heal what the root is. Um, it might bring some freshness and newness to your marriage, but there's still something else. Um, I've read before, you can't just tell somebody to go get new lingerie and to spice up the bedroom because um, there still might be something there that's in, there's some insecurities, unwillingness to actually be vulnerable in that way. So, so even though going out and doing those things are fun and exhilarating and fresh and new, but there's still something holding back and that's what needs to be discussed and that's what needs to be brought out. And the proper time to bring out those kind of conversations is not at 1130 at night. Um, it needs to be during a time when things have been set aside and you said, hey, let's have a real conversation for the next hour or two uh, without distractions and let's talk about this. Can't be going before work, obviously. Can't be during work. It's obviously going to have to happen after work. Um, or on Saturdays or Sundays, but having a real conversation to say, hey, I want a new marriage with you and let's get a plan. And I know that we put this into practice and that was we needed to come in agreement on some things in our lives, whether it be um, you know, a new home, uh, it could be just where we see ourselves in three years. So we did the practice of opening up our journals. We separated for this process to separate it in like, I went to the coffee shop and I wrote this down, separation. So I separate, I said, so okay, Lord, we are believing for this in our lives. And I began to write all of these things down that I just felt the Lord was putting on my heart or my own desires. And then she did the same thing. We came together uh, intentionally and said, let's switch journals. We switched, we circled, we said things, we liked this, we liked that. She said things I didn't think about. I said things she didn't think about. And then we came in agreement and then we prayed right there for those things, which was a great process to walk through together because it opens up the, the heart and, and her visual of what she sees and her desires. And then I, I want that too. I want that for her. So those things helped us. And that's just a, a very simple process and practice to do. Setting that time apart to say, hey, let's get some of these desires and conversations we've we've had out into the prayer out of let's place it before the Lord and let's talk about it. So that's been huge. Then it gives you an opportunity to begin to praise God together for it. Often uh, people come into church and we'll see married couples coming in looking so worn out and weary, um, like you just carried in a ton of bricks, you know, that you got, you know, it's just, it's a lot. Yeah. And I, I think my conversation with that is, is that because you have not taken the time to um, process according to the word of God in a way that's easy and light, meaning God, we're going to take these cares and concerns about our home, about our finances, about our children. You can do all of this about our uh, habits, likes, dislikes, um, extracurricular activities we want to do together, you know, whatever that conversation may be, and then come together and say, all right, hey, let's cover this in prayer. What we commit to God, he can cause to be established and to succeed. Then you've got something to uh, really look forward to and get excited about and expect and you're able to just praise God, knowing that God's already heard you and that he's working even before you see it happen. Yeah. We don't have all these things that we've written down yet in that journal, but I'm praising God for it. Why? Because we've committed it to the Lord in prayer. Uh, there's still some things that we want to come together and grow in, but you know what? We're talking about it yeah. so I can praise God for it and know that, that God is doing a new thing in our marriage because we're having that healthy conversation with the Lord yeah. and with one another. Yeah. Now, just to spend just a few minutes on this before we wrap up, Anna and I were introduced to a new uh, process um, of how to relate to one another, how to talk to one another, and the best way to, the, you could call it the thermometer, and, or the thermostat. And let's say she's at the temperature of 65, and I'm at the temperature of 72. 
Um, and just in the, and just like in the natural, you go in the house, she wants it colder. I want it warmer or whatever. I think it's vice versa. I'm 72. <laughs> you're 65. You got that backwards. I'm not cold. I don't like it cold either though. You know what I'm saying? Sure. When our thermostat, when we walked through this, oh, I go in saying, the higher okay, degrees. Right. You go in the, yeah. So Anna, 72, I'm 65. So it's matching the middle to go the compromise of where we are. Well, that even it relates to how we have conversations together so that if she's, if I can see that she's getting to the 72 mark, then it's my job to say, okay, she's getting there. It's my responsibility of what do I need to do? It's also her responsibility to know it as well to go, okay, I'm getting heated. I'm getting hot, you know, whatever. What do I need to do? And bringing these, this conversation back down. Um, how can we compromise on certain things? How can we handle it? A compromise would be like, for instance, um, give me a good example of a compromise within the thermostats analogy here. So on my end, because once again, ownership of what this looks like, if I recognize that I'm stirred up or irritated, then I've got to take a moment and, and have have a moment where I'm aware of it. Oh, okay, you're agitated over this. Have you talked to the Lord about it? Are you being too sensitive about these things? Have you spent time with the Lord today to recognize you need some help? Is this a conversation where you are looking at it through, um, because for me, whenever I get to that place, I'm looking at it from like a, um, I don't know, that it's worse than what it really is type of a scenario. And that's, that has come through learning more about myself. Um, on your end, yours was that you get quiet and then it's addressing the situation. So you guys, I think a lot of this, when you bring up the whole thermostat aspect of, of your life, I mean, you know, we're talking about today, the love walk, we're talking today about finding new things and writing a vision down and saying, I want a new marriage. But there's an awareness where you realize, oh, okay, this is where I'm at. I'd really like to grow. Uh, Lord, show me. Holy Spirit, lead and guide me into what these conversations look like with my spouse. Yeah. So for me, it's waking up to it. And we've got a lot of people that, that um, maybe haven't quite yet awakened to the fact that they're hot heads or right, yeah, they like to hide out and run from whatever it might be. I don't know. Well, yeah, they'll, they'll tend to obviously defend themselves and not take the high road or take the road less traveled, which is the forgiveness road and just saying, you know what? Um, I'm going to examine my heart. I'm going to do better. I'm going to pay attention to these things. Uh, but that thermostat model is really great because it puts in perspective of, of how you perceive things, how you see things, yeah. and, and how you can say, all right, I know who you are, and I know what are your triggers on certain, on certain things. And so I want to be aware of that. So in this particular room that we go discuss these topics, whether it be with our children, you're at a 75 and I'm more at a 70. You want me at your 75 because you're a little bit more intense or not intense. I don't want to use that word as it's a bad thing, but you're just more in like engaged with the children than maybe someone else is. And you just kind of want to be more laid back and more cooler and all those kind of things. And it's like, no, no, no. I need you to bring this up a little bit with this. I need you to help me with this. And so uh, that kind of helps with that process to go, you know, I need to come up. I need to go up. And I need to be a, uh, a little bit more attentive and aware. Recognizing each other's personality differences and then um, just accepting and encouraging yeah. and then really wanting to grow with it. Yeah. Something I recognized with me being at that capacity of, oh, I can go zero to 10. I can go 70 to 80 in a second. And that's something I'm working on right now with the Lord is uh, asking myself, am I trusting God? Um every day with these things? Or am I trying to control the situation? And then if I'm trusting God, then I also trust you yeah. because you are my spouse, you hear from the Lord, and this is how we're going to flow together and have a greater marriage. And that's been a huge part of growth for me in my love walk of receiving God's love. Because if you know God loves you, you want to trust him. 
And that'll help you to trust your spouse. Why? Because if you're praying and you're doing these things and you're building and you're trying new things together, guess what? You're going to grow. Yeah. You're going to grow and it's going to be beautiful. Um, so take a deep breath and receive God's abundant grace with it all today, yeah. you know, because that's, that's a huge part of all of this. Yeah. Begin to walk in love and see each other through the eyes of love, God's love. That's okay. the key ingredient. Do we finish with 1 Corinthians 13? Um, <laughs> sure. Go. I think we should. Okay. All right. Wait, do you want me to read it or do you want to read it? Yeah, you, you okay. got it open. Right. Go. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away child childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Hey, thanks everyone for tuning in. We are so thankful and we would encourage you to share it, like it, send it to your friends. Come on, uh, get this out there somewhere. We love you. You have a great marriage. God (laughs) loves you too. All right. Bye.